here to bring you the latest hangout on air with my good friend Jason Horst of Xanadu Gallery. This time we're talking about networking, how to find qualified buyers using networking. We really appreciate everybody signing on. If you are not going, if you are not on the xanadugallery.com forward slash hangout, that is the best place to view this. I also want to let you know that uh, this recording, this broadcast will be recorded and it will be available as a YouTube video. I'm sure Jason is going to embed it on that Hangout page I just gave you and I'll have it in my artprintissues.com blog as well. So once again we thank you for participating. There is a question box that you can enter in questions on the xanadugallery.com forward slash Hangout web page and there are already some questions there and we'll be working our uh, best to answer all of those questions. So with no further ado, let me introduce my good friend Jason and come on in Jason. Hey Barney, how's it going? Good to see you. Likewise, this is going to be a fun one. Yeah, I'm looking forward to this conversation and I know I've, got, I've seen a lot of the uh, posts on our Google Plus event page and it looks like people are very interested in the uh, topic of networking. So we should dive in and see what we can figure out about networking. Yeah. I think the first thing we mentioned was what is networking? I know I have an opinion about what it is. What's your idea? Well, I think, um, and, and I think maybe a lot of people have this idea. You say the word networking and they imagine a room full of people. Uh, you know, maybe you got to go in and start mingling with people and trying to get to know people and then hoping that somehow magically that getting to know someone is going to lead you to get to know someone else and, and the pieces will all fall into place and you'll become fabulously wealthy because of all these connections that you have. Um, and I think there is some of that in networking. Uh, but I think of networking as much a, uh, I think of it as much as a, a way of life um, or, or a way of living as it is um, an action or, or some kind of event that you're participating in. Um, you know, networking is basically just being able to build good, solid relationships and contacts with people and, and then naturally leveraging those contacts to try and get to know the people that your people know. Um, and, uh, you know, I'm, I, I'm not much of a schmoozer or, or a networker maybe in the way you think of the traditional sense, but I, I sure um, love making relationships with people. And what I found is that if I have a great relationship with someone where I'm you know, providing them as much as they're providing me, it almost naturally happens that they want to invite me into their circle of people that they know, um, and that then leads me to a whole new set of relationships, which can then just kind of ex expand exponentially as you get to know people. And, you know, obviously it's important to try and get to know the right kinds of people, but um, I found that sometimes relationships that you you wouldn't have been thinking of in terms of how can I turn this relationship into something valuable for my business. Sometimes even those relationships can lead to opportunities or experiences that are very valuable. And so I, I look for networking uh, opportunities everywhere that I go. Wow, well said. I think we're done now. We can go home. <laughs> uh, those, those are all great thoughts, Jason. And as uh, you and I, uh, these are not as formal as some of the other broadcasts that we do where we have handouts and uh, slideshows. I should have mentioned that earlier. This is more of a discussion between you and me on topics that we're passionate about and want to bring the thoughts that we have and that we've experienced to the artists who are listening today. And as you were saying that, this is a little bit extemporaneous in case anybody hasn't noticed that's sort of the way we fly on these things. It made me think of you and I, or you and me more appropriately. I met you because I saw something on Facebook from one of your fans who was talking about your new book and I saw this fellow's written a book, he's got a gallery, he's down the road in Scottsdale, it looks really interesting. I called you up and introduced myself and you were immediately just what you talked about, friendly and open to me and said, yes, you would like to meet me. I was in my car, had my book and came down and saw you probably within the hour of me calling you. And I just cold call you and cold call you and you were wide open and that began a fruitful relationship for both of us. So you had somebody putting it out there for you to just let it, let it be known that you had something going on. I saw it and acted on it. 
I think that's a perfect example of networking that has nothing to do with hanging out at a you know a business um, mixer or a chamber of commerce local monthly meeting. That's what I call targeted networking. You were somebody that it seemed obvious to me we had something in common. We're both interested in the art market. We're interested in helping artists. We're both authors. We should know each other, and we're close by. We are ge geographically desirable to each other, and that I don't remember how many years ago that was. When when did you first publish the? Yeah, that's been uh, it's been four years ago that I published my book. So it has to be good, you know three and a half four years since we first met. Yeah, and look what's uh, come out of that. We're we're sitting here today. I don't know how many of these we've done now. Probably close to a dozen, maybe. Uh, it sure, sure seems like that. And um, still going strong with all kinds of collaborations that are good for you and for me. So uh, that's a, a just a, a, a side look at a perfect example of, of networking. And I, I agree with you that uh, just the idea of cold calling and walking up into a meeting of strangers, that's pretty much a waste of time and a lot of anxiety that most people go through when they're put into a public situation and they have to go around and try to be happy and meet people and get to know them. There's a few of us that are just that outgoing and extroverted that it's a natural thing for, but most people that's a stressful situation to be in. So networking doesn't have to be stressful. You have to work at it. You can get better at it. But the reason you want to network is to have relationships with other people that can help you and that you can likewise help them. And even though um, in the back of your mind there may always be, you know, you might always have some neurons firing that are saying, what can I do to, uh, you know, take advantage of the opportunity, you know, maybe someone I know knows someone that I want to know, and, and you're looking for opportunities to, to do that kind of thing. But I think that is, it is and should be a secondary thought in any relationship. You know, the primary thing has to be the relationship itself. If you're just trying to get to know people so that you can get through them to the people that they know, um, you, you know, basically to use them in a sense, um, that, that's going to be very ineffective. And I can say that because I know uh, people who have, have tried to, to get through me that way where it's been a, you know, just obviously a, uh, a networking attempt or an attempt to get to know someone that I know or, or take advantage of, of something that I have, um, et cetera. And, and anything like that, any inauthenticity or, or um, you know, insincerity is, is going to come out very quickly. And so I guess for me, when I think of networking, I just think of, of sincerely trying to create relationships and friendships. And, um, you know, if, if you're sincere in that and, and practice those skills, um, you know, practice getting to know people and finding out what they know. And then also um, start giving them... Uh, you know, providing them with anything that you have that might be of service to them, giving them your, of your knowledge or access to people that you know. There's a kind of sense of reciprocity that comes into play where people want to come back and, and give to you. So when I think of networking, it's really just that natural um, natural relationship that's, that's built. I'm, I couldn't agree more on that. I know uh, you and I sometimes worry that we sound like, hey, you said something nice and I agree and I say something nice that you agree. But usually the reason I think that we work so well together is we do agree on so many things. We come at it from different experiences. My background was selling advertising and trade shows in the, in the uh, um, art market, uh, the magazine business, and yours is obviously in the gallery business, so we have this synergy, but it's we've dealt with different people coming along the way, but we've come to a common ground on so many of the different things that we've talked about. One of the things I think that you mentioned that is so important is uh, giving back. There's a saying at the BNI, that's the world's largest networking organization. They have over 4,000 chapters around the world where groups of small business owners meet once a week and they give each other leads and they get up and give a one-minute speech about what their business is. And their motto is givers gain. And they know this uh, from data that the people who in these organizations who give the most leads, who work at finding their business partners in their group, finding business for them turns into more business for the people who are doing that. So there, it's it's altruistic because you're helping other people, but at the same time, the halo effect is it comes back 
you know, multiplication on you that you can't produce by just asking people without having something in mind to help them. And um, I, I think one of the benefits of networking is is that yeah, the more people you meet, the more people you have in your arsenal to hook somebody up. And it can be over some things that you have nothing in common with. Let's say you know somebody who's a really good golfer, loves to play golf, and you know somebody else is a good golfer. You could care less about golf, but you introduce them, they go out and have a good time. They're going to both thank you and be talking about you while you're playing golf. And you've created a relationship out of something that you did that came out of your networking that's just a byproduct of it. So that's, that's just one example of how the larger you grow your network, the more important in, uh, you can become to the people within your network. Well, and I think, um, you know, you also have to, in order for any of that to happen in the first place, you have to get out there. And I'm sure that a lot of the, uh, so you know, a lot of the artists who are uh, listening to this or, or listening to the recording, their question will be, okay, great, I get the idea that you want to build friendships and relationships, but where can I go to find people that will really be um, beneficial to me that, that um, would have something where I could offer them something of value and they could offer me something of value? Um, and, and I think that, um, you, you know, you, you really have to be thinking of where can I get out there where there are going to be people that are going to have an interest in art um, or, or that may be able to cultivate an interest in art. And that's kind of where I would start the, uh, the, the networking efforts. Um, wh what are your thoughts, Barney? Where would you go yeah. to network if you're an I, artist? I, I, I uh, believe in reverse engineering for a lot of different things. Um, and this is true of how to find your customers or your, your collectors. Who are the people that are already buying from you? Study what they do. They bought from you because they're, in, they're most likely in some, some kind of a social uh, economic demographic that, ha that is willing to buy art. And so they hang out somewhere. It, not necessarily at the you know, polo club, but um, maybe they are involved in certain charities or they're involved in some other kind of civic group or they're involved in some kind of, um, it could be um, a, a local meetup group. You have to ask questions of the people that, um, that are already buying from you in a conversational way so you're not just drilling them with questions, but get to know them. As a result of getting to know them, you'll get some clues as to what they do, what their habits are, where they go, and then make your effort to try to be present where possible within them. Um, I also think you can ask for referrals. Um, one of the good ways to ask for referrals is, is you mentioned the word reciprocity. Uh, there's a famous book by a fellow named Robert C. Aldini who wrote um, a book called Influence, and one of his main uh, principles is that there's something called the norm of reciprocity and that is proven fact and you know it already intuitively if you give somebody something of value, it doesn't have to be a lot, it could be small value, they are more inclined to do something for you. So one of the things I think artists can do that's very affordable, it's a really cool tool, it's called magcloud.com. If you've listened to these presentations that you and I have done, I've mentioned it numerous times because I'm a strong believer. M-A-G-C-L-O-U-D dot com. It's, it's run by Hewlett Packard and you can upload images into MagCloud and then they will, uh, you do a layout and just upload a PDF and you can make a, 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 a printable magazine that's anywhere from four pages up to I think over a hundred pages. The last time I checked, which has been a while, but I'm sure these prices are pretty close, you could do 20 copies um, for about 60, a 20 page booklet uh, magazine, four color slick, glossy paper for about 67 bucks. So that's three dollars, a little bit more and change for something that's 20, 20 pages. Imagine giving that to somebody who's a potential collector or a collector and then saying at the same time, um, I would like to. I'd like to give you this, and then either at the same time or at the appropriate follow-up, say, you know, I have other copies of that. If you have friends that you think might be also be interested in just having one of these portfolios, 
I'd love to give it to them. I can have you give it to them. I'd be happy to send it to them on your behalf and say, Jason thought you'd like to see this, and I'll drop it in the mail to them. So that's asking for a referral, but in a very soft manner, not like saying, can you tell me somebody else who'd like to buy my art, which is more of a crass way of doing it. And you've already endeared yourself by giving something of value to that person in the first place, which they're probably going to enjoy. They already like your art and most likely have bought it already. So, yeah, and I um, just just a couple of examples um, from my experience in networking, some things that have led to uh, sales or, or good uh, contacts. Uh, I had a um, I'll start with one that was just recently. I had a client who bought several pieces from us about four or five years ago and she contacted us um, this last spring and said Jason I'm going to be donating one of the pieces that I purchased from you to the uh, to a local hospital I'm giving it to their foundation they they did something great for me saved my life etc and uh, I'd like to, to do something nice for them and give them uh, one, of, one of the pieces of artwork could you help me figure out how to do this and um, I've already contacted the foundation etc but um, I'd just like to get you involved in it and, and give them some advice on how they might place it etc and of course I said sure and found out who she had talked to with the hospital's foundation and I invited both our client and the the head of this this foundation to come to the gallery and I took them both to lunch um, so that we could talk about this donation and placing the piece of artwork and while we were at lunch, uh, I got to visit with both the client and the, the, the leader of the foundation. And it was just great to be able to start a relationship there. And then I offered the, uh, the, the, the president of the foundation to help with the installation of the artwork, the placement of the piece, um, and also had a conversation about how they might be able to get more artwork into the, uh, into the hospital. Now, um, you know, I, I really believe that what my client was doing was just a, a, out of the goodness of her heart, and I wanted to be of service, um, hopefully out of the goodness of my heart as well. But I also believe that that um, opportunity, we, and we've just recently placed the, the first piece of artwork and then are working on donating a second piece um, through the gallery, but I believe that, that this president of the foundation has great contacts, and she's a big fan of ours now that we've helped her, and so I believe that... Um, you know, she's interested in putting on some events in the gallery where she's going to bring people down um, to talk about artwork, and, and that's going to lead to, to, to um, potential relationships. Um, I have made relationships through um, going to church uh, and, and have met people that way, and, you know, I never overlook, you know, everyone I talk to knows that I have an art gallery. They know that I love artwork. Um, you know, and I will talk to them about it, and in the past, that's led to, to sales. Even though I'm not specifically putting the strong arm on someone in, in that kind of setting, um, you know, inevitably, people who love art are going to gravita gravitate towards people that they know, and so I want to look for those opportunities. So I guess what I'm saying is the opportunity to network is all around you, and um, it's just a matter of of finding the ways to build those relationships and then hopefully steering your activities um, to events and places where there are people of a caliber that are going to be interested in art and that are going to have the disposable income to be able to afford to buy art. I, perfect segue for me there. I, in my book, uh, Guerrilla Marketing for Artists, I have a chapter on networking and I talk about a couple of things in there that you just touched on. One is that um, ask yourself, how many people do you know? And I give you a little memory jogger in the book of different kinds of professional people or other people that you might know, whether it's a school teacher, a fireman, a neighbor, a doctor, a chiropractor, a plumber. Obviously, all, not all of those are going to be good prospects for you, but they should know that you're an artist because um, I use the example of a waitress, for instance. A waitress probably, or wait person if I want to be really politically correct, um, may not have the disposable income to buy your art, but what they do have is they talk to lots of people all the time. They're often great networkers, and they have a variety of, of uh, people that come in. Some of them they get to know because they're regulars. If they know you're an artist, know you have art available, that person can tell somebody else about you 
that you wouldn't think, you know, you should not pass up on the opportunity to let somebody know that you are an artist and that you have art for sale just because you've prejudged them not to have the money to be able to buy your work. That would be a wrong thing to do. In my opinion, you'd be shutting down the potential opportunity for that person to lead you to somebody else because it's not... I believe that people like to buy from art and almost anything from people they like. It's just human nature. So if that philosophy is true, your easiest sales are the people in your warm market who already know you. And I believe the next group of people that's easiest to sell are the people they know. And then the people they know. There's a lot of low-hanging fruit all around you. In most cases, I know there's somebody who wrote in one of the um, questions about living in a rural or lightly dense, a lightly populated area and that doesn't hold true. None of these things we say do 100%. But in general, let everybody know that you're an artist. It doesn't mean that you're asking them to buy something or come to your studio or, or go to a gallery. So, But they should know what you do. If they don't, you're missing opportunities. And I guess that kind of leads to the, uh, the next question, and I think a lot of artists struggle with this, and that is, how do I bring it up, or what do I say about myself? What specifically could an artist say to, to bring up their artwork? And I, uh, you know, we talk about a little bit about having an elevator speech, et cetera, but, right. um, but what, what do you think about that, Barney? What would be well, the... Thanks. Um, cut you off, sorry. I was so eager to answer. <laughs> um, the first, it comes back to a, a little bit of that norm of reciprocity. Be interested in the other person first. Ask them questions. What do you do? That's interesting. Tell me a little more. Let Get to know them. The natural reaction to that is, what do you do? Some people, they don't get it, and they're, and they're not going to, they're not, they won't reciprocate and ask you questions personal about yourself because they're kind of, maybe they're narcissistic and just want to talk about themselves. Those people are probably not your best prospects for marketing. Um, at least networking through. So ask people first what they do. The natural inclination of people then is to tell me a little bit about what you do or tell me what do you do. And that's where your elevator speech comes in. You ask me what I do, I will tell you I help artists, visual artists succeed at the business of art. That usually as people, then I just stop there because it begs a question. Tell me how do you do that? What do you do? Give me some more specifics about it. And I think artists need to do the same thing. Either that or just casually mention, you know, I, I, was, uh, I was on a ride. I, I took a trip. I was at, the, I was at a gallery. Oh, that reminds me of a, something I painted a couple of years ago. That reminds me of something I donated. Or use a, a kind of a, a side reference. Don't just blurt out, I'm an artist. Would you like to see my work? kind of work your way into it and that again begs the question what kind of art do you make or do you and you these things take a little practice that's again start with your friends your family you know make them earn a little if if you're going to give somebody a piece of art make them earn it by having them work out some networking with you until you can say these things naturally and if you practice them so that they come off your tongue just like you're asking somebody about the weather instead of being nervous and trying to remember what to say it will be much easier for you you won't be uh, nearly as nervous or tense on that same note I shows. would encourage um, artists to actually write out the whole introductory scenario um, you know if you could write a little bit of a dialogue back and forth um, imagining that some, you're meeting someone for the first time at a party or at a show. Um, write out what you might imagine them saying to you and then what you imagine yourself saying to them. There's something about the act of writing and thinking it through in a formal way and, and getting it out onto to paper or your word processor um, that forces you to work through the various scenarios and, and think about it. And it also I think cements in your mind what it is that you're going to be saying about yourself as you, you're talking to people and, and so that it can become second nature. And, and then as Barney says, practicing that and, and taking some opportunities. It's not a bad idea 
Uh, we talked earlier that it's not you're not necessarily going to make the world's greatest connections at uh, you know the business networking groups or whatever, but it's not a bad idea to participate in those just for the the practice of uh, of meeting new people and getting to know them and building yeah. relationships. Good point. Um, warm up over there, even if it's um, uh, even if it's your like your your uh, farm club, not really your your major league opportunities. Knowing what you want, I think probably the most often asked question in any social gathering, whether it's uh, formal networking or you know it could be at a uh, um, a wedding where groups of people are brought together who don't know each other, the most common thing to ask is what do you do? And that's where your elevator speech should come in. You should be able to fluently answer that question as if it's second nature. You do not want to be thinking about asking, you know, coming up with something off the top of your head and hoping it sounds really good. That should, it shouldn't sound like can patter. And the way you get around that is you smile when you talk to somebody, you open your eyes. I don't know if you realize this, but when you open your eyes, you are smiling genuinely. If you smile just with the corners of your mouth and don't open your eyes, it's not nearly as effective. People are very, they catch subtle clues. So be friendly, open your eyes. In fact, if, you have a, if you're worried about stuttering or anything, Marilyn Monroe, Howard Cosell both used a simple technique of taking a short breath before they spoke. It stopped them from stuttering. It will do the same thing for you and stop. It will just arrest that nervousness you have a little bit so that then your whatever you're going to say comes out more fluently. So be friendly and open. Be willing to listen to what other people have to say. Be interested in them and always be cognizant of why you're there. I'm looking to meet people who might become friends or connections that can ultimately deepen my relationship, my networking, and look for ways you can help them. And I think that um, there's also a, a common mistake, um, and, and I had just recently read an article about this, where a lot of people will think, oh, if I'm going to some kind of event where there's going to be a lot of people, I've really got to work the room and meet every single person in there, let every single person know what it is that I do, and try and get you know, some kind of a business card or something into their hands. And I found that actually... That's the least effective way to to network. Um, when I'm in a room full of people, I found that I'm far more successful if I just focus on just having a very few brief encounters. I'd rather make one connection that's a deep, rich, high quality connection than 150, you know, acquaintances that that are going to forget about me before the end of the evening. And so it's often the case, even even here in the gallery, when we're having an opening or an event. Um, yes, obviously, I want to make sure everyone is is greeted and welcomed. But I'm focusing on the the one relationship, and and uh, you know you really can only have one re start one relationship at a time. And I'm willing to spend time with people, and I would encourage you to do the same. Just just focus on, and that's going to be a lot more comfortable for you as well if you're not panicking and freaking out that you got to get around and, and talk to everyone. Uh, good points. You mentioned something that we said we would talk about and that is no to business cards. I think a couple of things. Business cards are so 20th century. Who uses those anymore? And I also think business cards are the kiss of death. Here's my business card. It's It relieves somebody of an obligation to do anything more than that. I've gone to close to 150 trade shows in my lifetime. I, I must have given out thousands and thousands of business cards to people and gain, and took an equal amount and there was just a tiny fraction of those business card exchanges that ever turned in to anything. The only way they turn into something is if you do something about it in the first place. And it, as an artist you, you have a visual product so have something that's larger, a, a, a 3 by 5 or a 4 by 6 postcard that's harder for somebody to throw away than a business card. I've got a stack of business cards, you know, 12 inches long that I never look at. But so that postcard I'm going to look at, it's going to be a reminder. And I know for guys that may be a little harder to have that in your back pocket, but if you're wearing a sport coat or something, you can carry it. Um, and if you do, if you do, I say no to business cards. I would only give them out at the last resort. And I would also only give it out when I can say, if you feel there's any chance of a connection here, 
can um, can I follow up with you? Let's get a meeting. Can we talk next Wednesday? Can I have you over to the gallery on Thursday? Make something happen of it, and then do a follow up. Don't just ask and not follow up. That's really bad news. So make be proactive. Take if you have to get down to that business card, but in any relationship, try to. If you think there's something good there, follow up. Make it. Make something happen from that networking. You. You took all that time to get there, and now do something about it. Don't just let it fall away like so many people do. And I think sometimes um, you might have a little bit of a, you know, might be a little nervous or a little afraid that somebody, maybe they were just humoring you by talking to you, and maybe they're not really interested in the relationship. Maybe they don't want to, uh, you know, spend any more time with you. And so that consequently makes you afraid to try. And what I would say is, all the more reason to try. I, you know, I want to ask someone for that that follow up and that that opportunity to to continue to build the relationship because the 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 worst that can happen is they say, ah, no, I'm not really that interested, and they've just saved you all of the thinking about it, wondering about it, and regretting that you didn't do something in the future. They've they've made it obvious, um, but I think that you'll actually find most of the time if if you've got a good feeling about the relationship. Um, most of the time, the other person, the the other side of that that relationship will as well. And um, you know, you're as an artist, you have uh, think about it. You have this huge advantage that you're doing something that most people find absolutely fascinating and captivating. I, I hope I don't offend anyone by saying this, but you're not an insurance salesman. You know, <laughs> it's the insurance salesman I used that to we do all that run too, from. So. <laughs> yes, Barney, you know what I'm talking about. Then, um, you know, and and people automatically when they start talking to an artist, they want to know, oh, you know, how did you become an artist? How do you do it? Uh, you know, all all those kinds of curiosities that people naturally have, even if they don't know a lot about artwork. And so you can leverage that to. Um, you know, to create that that interest and and then hopefully continue to build the relationship based on on um, you know your other skills of getting them to talk about themselves, etc. Um, great, I, a great point. I I have written used this uh, phrase a lot. I think it was even in my most recent uh, um, blog post on artprintissues.com where I mentioned uh, art is sexy, plumbing is not sexy. Sorry to plumbers and and um, insurance agents, but there's, there's, it lacks that the uh, je ne sais quoi, you know, that uh, I know not what that artists have. There's a, you have a unique thing that's going on, be, probably because there's beauty attached to it and there's creativity attached to it. And so that gives you an advantage that you, you don't have as, in some other more mainstream, somewhat mundane, um, ways of making a living. So don't squander that. When when you have art uh, as a, what you do, then be that person. I think, um, I talk a little bit about it in the book, that you need to make, you only have one chance to make a good first impression. So I, when you do these things, you would want to, you don't want to overdress, but you don't want to show up as this lovingly artist with Birkenstocks and sandals, or some kind of wild get-up that just that, especially if it's not you, look professional. People take clues from how you appear. If you look professional, I think you'll feel better about yourself and be more confident. Which leads me to another point, and that is, confidence is sexy, and it is attractive. If you if you go into a room full of people. You know, the natural inclination is to believe that the most attractive people are the ones that are surrounded by people. If you really look at what's going on in human nature, I believe it's the people that are most self-confident that attract the most people. It has a more attractive quality, in my opinion, than just physical beauty. Nothing wrong with being good looking. It can't hurt. But I think that you can equally trump that equally trump, that doesn't make sense. I think you can trump that by being confident in yourself. And there's a saying, fake it until you make it. If you don't feel that great self-confidence wise, just like we were talking about practicing what you want to say to people in a 
uh, in a given scenario. Practice being confident. It's it's how you hold yourself. Be a little, stand up a little straighter. Hold your shoulders back a little higher. Put your head up a little higher. Hold your chin up. Things. If the way you present yourself makes people more interested in you, and then if you're saying other things that are interesting, and you're an artist, you got a lot going on there for yourself that makes somebody want to get to know you. So start putting all those things together. I know we're throwing a lot out there at you, but it's it's totally doable. And when you think about what the potential results of this are, they're fantastic. They can snowball into great things for you. I I had coined a phrase called "struff rangers," and I, I used it in talking about social media. Social media is just online networking, but it's really with strangers. You're getting people who are supposed to be your friends, but they're totally strangers to you. Your networking person in person, that person is not a stranger to you. So use your confidence to meet those people in person and keep keep that in perspective with social media and other kinds of more uh, impersonal marketing. Yeah, I, um, I, I think what it sounds like we're saying is that it's just a, a really important for a, an artist or, or really anyone in the art business to just be out there and going. And I, I think that kind of goes contrary to maybe the stereotypical picture that we have of the artist, which is the artist is in the studio slaving away at the easel, is maybe a little bit reclusive, uh, you know, would prefer to be a hermit if at all possible. And I know some artists who are that way, who are are less comfortable in public scenarios and are not interested in in doing it. And and um, you know, I think that uh, artists used to be able to to build pretty successful careers even if they were not out there and not getting around and and not networking. But I think that's becoming. Uh, more and more difficult as it be, you know, kind of there's a, this shift with what's happening online and um, with opportunities that you have to make direct contacts and direct sales. Um, that it's becoming more and more incumbent on an artist to become more outgoing. And so I would encourage you to just start taking little steps that way. You know, if you've not not spent a lot of time out in public or getting around. Uh, just set a goal over the course of the next month to get out to a couple of local events and and to mix and uh, set a goal to take someone to lunch, take a client, a former client to lunch or an interior designer in your area, someone who's somehow related in the business but um, you know could could potentially uh, lead to 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 more contacts for you. Anything you can do along those lines will help. Here, here's something that will. Um, uh, scare a lot of people, but I think the potential that comes out of public speaking is enormous. And I know that uh, most people would rather go have a root canal without uh, anesthesia than think about doing public speaking. But Jason, you do a lot of it, and I do a lot of it. It really is, if you're afraid of it, it's just in your head. Um, I think that as an artist, you don't want to go out and give a speech about yourself. But what you could do is give a speech about, do you have, what's the art history of your area? Is there a famous artist from your area? What are the art institutions in your area doing? Um, maybe you become somebody who's really good at knowing what's happening in your art scene and offer to do tours. Um, but if you can put together a 30 minute to make it flexible 30 minute to 90 minute PowerPoint or um, whatever the Mac, or, um, Mac version of that is, just a, a slideshow presentation that you can do to groups, that's going to put you in front of people who are potentially influential, who are interested in the arts. And if, if you do that, you're going to be invited to other groups and there are going to be people sitting in that. That might be that the that that person at the at the hospital that's looking for a connection, or that's just the way it works. I, I I posted on Facebook and Twitter last week. I had an article in the Arizona Republic about myself, about me. I got that article because I found the journalist that I thought was most likely to. Uh, want to write about me and I sent her an email and told her a little bit about who I was. I gave her a good storyline and within about 
three or four weeks of doing that, I had an article about myself and this podcast and Jason in the Arizona Republic. And it, as she said to me, you know, I write about people mostly, I have a certain number of people that I have to cover, their beats that I need to cover. I feel in the rest of the stories, most of those people come from one of two things. They either ask me like you did, or now they're in the system like you are now. And it will be much easier for you, for us, other reporters who are looking for certain um, takes or opinions on things related to what we talked about in, in this article, who will be contacting you. And that's just the way it goes. And if you get asked again, then the likelihood is that your your visibility just get, gets raised. So that happened because I sought the opportunity. But that's a networking opportunity that... Um, she told me to stay in touch with her. She would like if I have other story ideas. So this is a reporter, but this could happen with anybody who's influential in your area or in your in your own network. Well, and um, you know, we should also mention just and and it's a little bit of almost a cliche to talk about now because it's it's so widespread in in marketing circles and business circles. But but just how there's really such a a small degree of separation between you um, and anyone else in the world that you might want to get to know that uh, you, you know it's I think popularly it's the six degrees of Kevin Bacon or whatever it is right. um, but but you you know the chances are pretty good that if there's someone there's someone out there that can help you and help your business and you're probably only one or two people away from them if you can just figure out how to leverage those contacts and build those relationships they can probably get you to that person and sometimes you don't know who it is um, that, that that could maybe be your next big collector or benefactor a patron of yours or or someone who can really promote you to other people um, and that's why it behooves you to try and build as many connections as you can, um, you know, as many quality connections as you can. And the bigger your, you know, the bigger your connection chart is, kind of the bigger the net that you've cast out there. Uh, and I think one other thing I want to mention is that um, you probably know someone in your circle of influence or friends. You know someone who is just naturally a great uh, networker. They're great at getting to know people. They seem to know everyone. Um, and they seem to be able to get anything they want because they know the right people to talk to. I uh, have an example of that. Um, the, the, the gentleman who's the agent for the, the building owner that I have my gallery in, um, he did a lot of development here in the Valley, and um, including the, the development that my gallery is located in. And he is one of those kind of people who has never met a stranger. Um, you know, he meets someone, and within seconds, he's a good friend. He's a guy from Texas, so he's got that Texas drawl, and he's just, you know, he'll sit and talk to you, and it's amazing to me. He'll meet, um, for example, I, I had just hired uh, MJ, my, my workshop director and creative coordinator, and he had just met her one time for maybe, you know, five or six seconds while he was passing through the gallery last month. Well, when he came into the gallery again this month, he called her by name. Um, you know, and and had a warm conversation with her, and and it's just very natural and warm, natural and warm. And um, boy, I aspire to be as good at, at getting to know people as he is. But um, my point is that by getting to know him, I've had some some real benefits because he's so good at getting to know people. Uh, when we were building out our gallery space, we would run into a hiccup where we were having a problem with an inspection through the city. And so I would tell him, oh, we've just run into this little road bump in our in, in getting our, our inspections through. And he'd say, oh, you know what? I know one of the guys down in the, uh, you know, in the, the zoning office. Let me give him a call and see if I can't get something to happen for you. <laughs> and sure enough, he'd pick up the phone, make a phone call, and, you know, it wasn't as if he was somehow magically getting things changed, but what he would do is get things expedited and we'd find out, you know, what you need to do to get this done is talk to so-and-so and get such and such done. And something that might have taken my contractor or, or myself days to figure out and get it fixed, because he made that one phone call, it gets through in just a matter of a few minutes or, or hours. And so, um, you know, if you're not that person yourself, I encourage you to, to try and surround yourself with those people, um, because just just almost by osmosis, you start to get some of those those connections. And again, it can't be a one-way connection. You've got to be able to give them. You've got to be interested in them as well. But some people are just naturally connectors. They love to bring people together 
and um, and this guy that I know is certainly that way. He's just great at oh, you should meet my friend who's uh, you know an artist from uh, from Texas and and is always engendering those kind of of connections. Malcolm Gladwell, in his best-selling book, The Tipping Point, talked about three kinds of people: connectors, mavens, and salesmen. Uh, connectors are just exactly the kind of person that you're talking about. They know an inordinate amount of people and they are the best ones for hooking somebody up. When you got a problem, I got your guy. Everybody knows that go-to guy, you know. It's the smaller version of Angie's List where there are people in your network that just naturally make it their point to know as many people as possible and they're connected in so many ways beyond us. Then there's what he called mavens, and those are people that not, aren't necessarily as well connected, but they, their opinions are highly sought after, and they're the early kind of, adopters and the, uh, the the stylish people that everybody wants to be like them. Yeah, or they just know stuff. You know, it maybe it's how to hang art or something. They just they 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 seem to be a repository of greater knowledge than the average person. And those people are very influential. And then salespeople, by their virtue of the job that they do, know on an average of something like ten times more than the average person. You know, my, when I was working for Decor Magazine, I had a database of 1,100 companies, and there were multiple people in those companies that probably knew and had spoken to over the course of 15 years, maybe five or ten thousand people, but knew pretty well, 1,500 to 2,000 people who were in some way or another involved in the art business. I was a, I was a salesman. I, I knew all these people. In fact, I believe I was a connector, too, that I could look. I, I saw those connections. I would meet somebody and go tingle a little bit because I can't wait to, there's somebody I need you to know. You need to talk to this publisher and you need to do this kind of person. I, get, I got, I I wasn't getting anything out of it other than the joy of knowing that my connections, I was able to help two people that I liked. And I'm sure it came back to me in, in other ways, but I, I never was looking at it like, yeah, you owe me now. It just, things came my way as a result of being that way. We should so. probably start jumping into some of the, uh, the questions that have been coming in. And if you uh, have additional questions that have come up during the course of our conversation about networking, uh, you can go into the question box and enter them here. Um, I can't hear you as well now, Jason, as I could before. Oh, did I lose you? No, I can hear you, but you sound quieter. I don't know if it's me or not, maybe. I am not sure. Oh, could just be me. Um, yeah, let's get some of those questions. I think that's a great idea. Um, so here's, uh, I'm just going to start kind of plowing through them in order, and I think uh, Jada from New York asked the question, and this is a good one, how does one follow up with clients, benefactors, or galleries without being perceived as a pest? And I, I guess my instant response is, I don't care if I'm a little bit of a pest. Um, I'd rather be a pest than be forgotten. And, um, you know, if you, I think that if you have... Um, you know, if you if you're confident in what you're doing, and you know that uh, Jada, you know that your artwork is is good, and that there are people out there who are interested in it, um, you, you'll pretty quickly get a sense of whether someone is or isn't interested if you start to have a conversation about it and start to follow up with them. And I don't worry about being a pest because people will let you know, oh, I'm not really interested, uh, but I'd rather hear that. As I said before, I'd rather hear that than not hear anything at all. Mm -hmm. Good answer. I don't, I don't think I can add anything to that. Don't be afraid to be, you don't have to be pushy, but you have to be somewhat assertive. And there's a difference. And go in there. Have that, if you're a little nervous, have that mag cloud in your hand. Be wanting, follow up with them with a way to do something. I'd like to give you something. You know, it was really great to meet you. Um, I didn't know if you, I mentioned it or not, but we offer a free hanging service for everybody that lives in the, in the local area. Or I have a referral program. If you can, if you refer me, I can do this for you. Or I have whatever it is. To have a reason. Don't just call the person and say, uh, I'm calling you back because I just want to call you back. Call them back with a reason and make it something that's potentially beneficial to them. Yeah, I think a lot of what we're talking about really is just 
it's salesmanship to its very core. Um, but but what we realize is that what we're selling when we're talking about networking is not necessarily a product or a service, but we're selling ourselves and, right. and the relationship that we can have. And so those same skills of follow up and um, you know closing and and all those kinds of things are going to come into play here. So it, it makes sense to become a student of of salesmanship as well. It never heard. That's a that's a skill that will help you throughout everything you do in life. Being able to ask for the order. Being able to ask for the order in a calm way when you're nervous and not show the nervousness. And the, being able to ask for the order might just be not necessarily asking somebody to buy something, but asking somebody for taking, let's take this to the next level in some way. Like, can I come meet you? Would you like to come to my gallery? Would you like to meet me at my gallery or my studio? or I have, Whatever it is. Have be assertive and take the lead, make a suggestion that furthers the relationship in one way or another. Yeah, I love the idea of um, an invitation to the studio. I think that's a uh, non-threatening way. Uh, you know, I do something that's interesting. I'm an artist. I my, Of course, this requires you to have a, a studio that's suitable for visits. Um, but people love to see where you work, and that will give you an opportunity to show them not only your artwork, but to talk to them about it, give a little bit of your background and history. And I love, personally, as a gallery owner, I love making studio visits and try and do it all the time, and that's a very non-threatening way um, to, to get to know one another. And when they're at your studio, offer them some wine and cheese and just make it a very pleasant and, and comfortable uh, encounter. Yeah, or if you have something else in common, um, you both like butterflies or you're in the orchid society to get you both you find some some common ground that has nothing to do with your art and nothing to do with their business but something that that person is passionate about maybe they're involved in the boys and girls club and you'd like to become involved or you've been involved or find that common ground and go there and then let the idea that you're an artist just bear fruit as a result of something else that you're doing. Yeah, that reminded me of um, another point I'd meant to make but we hadn't hadn't talked about yet and that is that I do try and um, over the years I've been a part of many different uh, boards and charity groups. Uh, I served on the American Diabetes Association uh, board for events that they've done related to art. Uh, I worked with the Scottsdale Museum of Contemporary Art and their board and and so we hadn't talked about those but those can be great opportunities to to meet people and again sometimes in surprising ways as well. I just thought I'd mention that before yeah, we Yeah, that's a good one. Rolled on. Someone asked uh, the question about um, uh, so um, do you have any suggestions how to use LinkedIn or other resources to network network with curators and buyers for art for public spaces? But if you do it. have an answer for that, I would love to hear it because I've got this huge <laughs> network of LinkedIn contacts, and um, uh, it, it boy, with all the social different social media you could be doing, it's hard to to sometimes know what's where to spend the time. Uh, Find out the people that are important that actually have the ability to move the dial some. Find out what groups they're involved in. Get involved in that group. Comment on that group. If you can make contributions to that group in some ways, get well known within that group. I wrote a blog post recently about the value of becoming slightly famous. And this is one way you can do it. Being slightly famous doesn't mean that you're well known in terms of publicity or you're on the local TV or radio, it just means that you maybe you're that public speaker or maybe you're that maven, that go-to person. Become that person. You will become somebody that that, that curator wants to know. Um, there was a talk about the curator at LACMA. Uh, I wrote about it in my first book, How to Profit from the Art Print Market. He had a quote and said, it's the steady drip, drip, drip that gets attention from me. I He gets bombarded. Imagine LACMA is the Los Angeles County Museum of Art, well-known high-end instit institution. And as the curator, he is totally bombarded. And what he said was, it is the steady drip, 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 the, 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 the tortoise that just keeps af after it. So don't be, dis don't be discouraged if, you own, if your first attempts, attempts don't really resonate with somebody. Continue to be pleasantly 
persistent. Believe in yourself, have different things to say, come at it from different angles, and eventually if you've got something of value, you're going to you're going to bubble up to the top. Um, did you want to tackle another one of those questions in there, Jason? Yeah, there are a lot of good ones here. Um, it's almost hard to pick, but uh, I, I'm, here's one from Shelley. She says, I'm curious what is the easiest, quickest, and most direct route to finding funding from collectors, benefactors, buyers, since I'd rather be painting and not and do not enjoy searching for funding. The only networking I really like is between artists. Um, and I think that, um, you know, I think maybe there's just a little bit of a, an attitude shift almost uh, or an outlook, a perspective shift there that uh, I would encourage Shelley to just start thinking about. It's not that you're going out into any scenario with your hat in your hand begging people for money. I think if you're thinking of it that way, then, then, then you are going to feel... Uh, reticent, reluctant to to go out and build relationships. Um, that that's not what we're suggesting here. And and I would I would have you think of networking not as some kind of short term tool that you can use to get you you know your your rent for this month or or whatever it is that is your current financial need. Networking is a long haul. It's a long picture, and you've got to be able to to build good long term relationships. And and it may be months or years before anything uh, of a financial benefit comes to you. Um, but by, by having a, a good steady beginning to those, those relationships and starting to throw those connections into the hopper right now and continuing to build that, that, that network of, of influencers and, and potential buyers you know, down the road, then you start to see the, the harvest from those efforts. And um, you know, it's kind of something where you just got to, it, it's a little bit of a numbers game, just, just like sales, where you've got to have uh, a lot of connections out there. And, and if, if you really feel like you'd rather be locked in the studio and you're not interested in doing this kind of thing, then you need to have someone in your life, uh, a partner, a spouse, a business manager, who's better at networking and is interested in doing it. Because I agree, if, if, you, if you don't like doing this and it's a chore for you, uh, and you're not willing to put in the effort, um, then then you're not going to be very successful, and and you probably shouldn't spend a lot of time doing it. You should be focused on being in the studio and working. But I found that sounds like you talking about blogging last time. Yeah, <laughs> you don't it, well, like it, don't do it. Well, yeah, I mean, find a more effective way if 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 you're just simply unable to do it. But what I have found is, in my experience, and the artists that I show in the gallery the ones who are most successful are the ones who are not only great artists but are also good at building relationships. People like to buy from people they like. Um, Fire asked a couple of questions here. One was, uh, as an abstract artist, I am often confronted with questions, what do you paint expecting a subject and which painting was yours? How do abstract artists convey, effectively convey themselves in a conversation? I think you have to talk about what is your inspiration and maybe you have to be a little bit of an educator so that people understand what abstract art is. So what are your influences? I'm influenced by nature. I'm influenced by science. I'm influenced by music. What, what, what inspired you to put that canvas on the paint and how is it? I love the fluidity of, you know, maybe talk about who inspired you, what other artists came before you and what they've done and, and instead of talking necessarily about your art, talk about some other abstract artist who is well known that's inspired you that you can use to talk glowingly about their art and then in turn bring it down to that's what inspired me to do this piece and these greens or these color blocks or whatever. So it's just feeling comfortable in your own skin and talking about it and if nothing else, while you're sitting there painting, you got plenty of time. Start talking about it in a way that makes you feel comfortable, so that you can become conversant with it. If you put it in the, in the right way, you can make that sound just like a a hymn to somebody or a lullaby that you care about it that much and you're emoting when you talk about it. That will that may be the thing that turns somebody into a lover of abstract art that previously didn't have a clue because nobody ever gave them any education and they didn't know where to even go to get it. You could be that person. 
Uh, Tyra also asked the question, um, and I'm just going to paraphrase it a little bit, but what are good conversation starters with people? Um, she says that when she's in groups where it may be a mixture of artists and collectors, she uses the are you an artist question, and I think that's a that's a good one. Um, uh, you know, I, I think you want to be a little bit careful. I, I always like to start with uh, introducing myself first. If I'm in a group, big group of people and I see someone that I want to have a conversation with them, I'll walk right up to them, hold out my hand and say, hi, I'm Jason Horsch. And, you know, depending on the setting, I might say, um, you know, if it's something where they are there for art or expecting it to be art, then I will let them know right away that, uh, you know, that I own an art gallery and I'll talk a little bit about the art gallery. And so for an artist, I would, would do the same thing. Introduce yourself um, and, and mention that you're an artist and then ask them their name and, and what they do, just as we discussed earlier. Um, but I think, you know, just, just simple conversation starters where there's questions to be asked, you know, talking about the weather and, you know, those kinds of things, the, the uh, you know, the, the little icebreakers and stuff, I think are, are a waste of time. I'd rather just get in and, and, and dive right into a conversation. You've got nothing to lose by, by jumping in. Um, or you can be a little bit more, you know, obtuse. Um, women are great for, I love your hair, like those shoes, where did you get that purse, um, which is an icebreaker. But you can also say, what brings you here? Are you local? Did you grow up here? Anytime you ask people about themselves, unless they're ex exceedingly shy, they're going to want to give you a, a good answer. So just learn to ask questions. Be observant. What are they holding in their hands? What are they wearing? Did you see them drive in? Are they with another person? Are they part of a group? Use anything, any clue that you have that you can see by just observing these people that might give you a way to ask something that's not just a generic question but something specific that shows that you have taken the time to get into them a little bit without them without even knowing them it's a way to make yourself well uh, attractive to other people by showing your your genuine interest in them well, it seems like we always run out of time before we run out of things to say or questions, <laughs> but uh, did you have any other last questions you wanted to get to? And I, I love it. I'm seeing that uh, in the, the Google moderator that we use allows people to ask questions, but you can also respond to other people's questions, and it looks like um, a number of you have been responding to each other. I love that, and, and would encourage you to do that, and, and that definitely adds to the, uh, to the conversation. Looks like we've, and I may just be missing some here, but it looks like we've gotten to most of them. I think we have. Um, there may be a few, but we, I think we have cut to uh, many of them. I guess uh, one last one. How about this? We'll take one last question. This one is uh, from Tim, and basically he says he's in a rural area, and he asks how far should he go in, in order to find networking opportunities, and I guess my answer is, as far as you have to go, Tim. Um, you know, although there, you know, there are some opportunities for artists in rural areas online that that hadn't been there before. Um, you know, you should definitely spend some time trying to leverage those contacts. But, but boy, I would sure try and find my nearest art galleries and and art shows. And even if I had to travel several hours or you know a day there and back to 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 make those contacts, you just it's not going to happen on its own. You got to get out there. There's something going on in your community, no matter how big or small it is, and it's maybe something that you're not involved with now, that you can use to kind of leverage yourself up into something else. It, I, I don't live in a rural area, so I can't quite take it from a personal point of view, but I do believe that there's probably untapped resources in your area that you haven't really had sat down and just give yourself some time to think through who do I know and who do these people know and who really lives here and how many of those people would I you know would, would be worthy of my time to go after that I could maybe do something for them and then likewise have them do something for me so don't don't discourage don't discount what's right underneath um, your fingertips locally even if it's a small area there could be somebody very if nothing else, maybe somebody very 
in, potentially influential politician, perhaps, um, that Business could introduce owner. you to someone else that could take you to another level in a whole other place. So don't be shy about going after those people. Let's call it a night. All right. Um, I would like to say if, if you were interested in um, learning more about buying any of my books, you could go to barneydavy.com forward slash products, and there you'll see everything that I do that's available. That includes the one book I talked about tonight, Guerrilla, Art, Guerrilla Marketing for Artists, that does have a chapter on networking and a lot more. So I'm going to be even there. bolder about it. I'm going to say you should go to Barney's blog <laughs> and check out his books because he has some, some really great information and advice. And, um, and you should follow his blog, uh, artprintissues.com. And, uh, and they can get there from barneydavy.com too, can't they, Barney? They're, um, I think so. <laughs> I, I, I never go there. I, I wouldn't know. Um, yeah, there, actually what there is on barneydavy.com is a link to sign up for my um, blog that you can uh, subscribe to my art print issues and get a weekly marketing newsletter from me. So it's all at barneydavy.com. And my blog is red.blog.com. And uh, as always, we'll look forward to seeing you guys next time around. It's been a blast. I enjoyed this a great deal. And thanks to everybody for participating and to those who are listening later on. Thank you and for your interest. You should consider Barney and I uh, your contacts, and you should be networking with us. So we certainly <laughs> consider you all our, our contacts, and, and um, there's certainly a lot of value in the relationship that's built between you and us through these uh, broadcasts and the, the newsletters, etc. So Thank thanks you, everyone. Jason. Let me, I'm sorry to cut you off. I know you're ready to close this down, but I want to mention this, and I'm sorry I didn't think of it earlier, but it's been on my mind. If you, you should... Um, uh, if we followed you um, on Google+, Plus, then follow us. If we make comments, do us a favor and plus one those. Just click on the plus one. And if, you've, if, um, if we've added you, then add us back. If we haven't added you, it's, just, it's not because we were trying to ignore you. So please add both Jason and I to your, to your uh, circles on Google+. Plus. That's how we all get to know each other better. And the plus one on comments, especially if it's a, about, a, or you go to my blog or Jason's blog, you can plus one those. Those help us rank higher in the search engine. So take care of us a little bit, take care of each other, and, and follow the people that you see in the questions here, or anybody else that might look like there's somebody worth noting. And that's it for me. And we're signing out. Thanks, everyone. We'll look forward to having you in our next broadcast. And I'll see you next week, Barney. All right. Peace out. <laughs>